Hello, everybody. My name is Craig Lukey, uh, your communications director, Local 2068. And today we're doing a special live stream with Virginia Diamond regarding the updates to the Virginia Line of Duty Act. Virginia, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Craig. Should I call you Jenny? Everyone calls you Jenny. I'm the only one calling you Virginia. You should call me uh, Honorable or something. No, Jenny's fine. The Honorable Jenny. And, and who do you represent? Introduce yourself to everybody for us. Sure. I am the legislative counsel for the Virginia Professional Firefighters. I'm uh, very happy and honored to work with the VPFF and uh, work with all of their locals on your uh, legislative program. Outstanding. So today we're, we're talking about the Virginia Line of Duty Act and the updates. And I know you've attended our general membership meetings several times. John, President Nemec has brought you in several times to talk to us, but this is a wider audience. So we want to make sure that everybody fully understands what's going on, exactly what the Line of Duty, Duty Act is. I don't even think a lot of our members even know it exists, what it gives us in our families or anything like that. So can you give us an uh, overview of what this act is and how it relates to us here in Fairfax? Sure, Craig, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to your members about this important uh, legislation. So the Line of Duty Act is a, a, a law that provides important benefits to firefighters who have either been injured on the job such that they can't perform their regular duties anymore, or for uh, firefighters or uh, EMTs who have been killed on the job. And uh, this um, act originally was uh, created back in the 1970s, and at that time it was a death benefit. And since then uh, it has been uh, expanded, and in fact in 2000 the Line of Duty Act was expanded so that it provides health insurance for either a disabled firefighter and their family or for the survivors of a deceased firefighter. So it, it's a very um, important uh, benefit for people who have um, made, these, made these sacrifices on behalf of the, uh, of the people of the Commonwealth. Uh, so in 2000, the reason why it was expanded was because of political and lobbying efforts by uh, your local, by your leadership, by your members, by the VPFF, and uh, we were able to get this um, important legislation passed uh, in 2000. Outstanding. So, so on the website, I, I see things. Well, well, let's get into the updates. What are the updates that take effect July 1st of this year? Okay, so um, after the... Uh, the health insurance benefits were added to LODA. Uh, there uh, grew some concern in the General Assembly uh, about the costs, uh, because uh, any, any disabled individual or any family uh, was able to um, access uh, insurance based upon uh, purchasing individual policies, or um, there are a lot of differences in terms of, of the types of insurance that were offered. And the legislature um, therefore decided that it, it was too expensive uh, because it was doubling in cost every several years. And as a result, they decided to um, form a task force to make changes in the law that would make it sustainable and that would uh, curtail some of the uh, rising costs. Uh, so the uh, Virginia professional firefighters participated in this task force. Uh, we made suggestions in terms of trying to preserve the benefits as best we could. Um, and uh, we, were able, we were successful in some regards and in other ways they made changes that we were not pleased about. Uh, but in any event, um, effective July 1st of this year, um, there are some changes that have been made in the Line of Duty Act that will primarily affect um, people who, who are disabled or deceased and their families after July 1st of 2017, but in some ways it will affect people who are currently receiving Line of Duty Act benefits. All right, so the website, there's a website that shows a lot of the, a lot of the things that we're gonna go over. It's valoda.org, correct? Yes. 
Um, information is available at uh, the Virginia Line of Duty Act uh, website, which explains um, a lot about the transition that's taking place. And it also has um, contact information so that people can uh, reach out and ask questions about their own individual cases. Now, when I go to the website, and I think a lot of our members are going to be the very first paragraph they're going to see is something about the Virginia Retirement System, VRS. We don't participate in that where other counties do that. So how, how even though that Fairfax has that work, Fairfax has not participate in VRS. So how does this work for us? Okay, so in the past, prior to July 1st of this year, the Line of Duty Act was administered by a state department called the Department of Accounts. One of the changes that the new um, amendments to LODA makes is that it transfers the administration of LODA from the Department of Accounts to the VRS. So it's got nothing to do with other aspects of the VRS. It's just that they decided to house the administration of the LODA program within the Virginia Retirement Service. Um, and they decided that that was appropriate because the Department of Accounts is basically a finance department and the uh, BRS has experience with um, um, health care decisions, et cetera. Oh, okay. So they're basically just managing the disbursement of money and, and the claims, correct? That's exactly right. Um, you know, we were somewhat um, uh, we, we were somewhat against the transfer because we were very happy with how the Department of Accounts has been doing it, uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, the legislature was determined to move it over to, to VRS and they're creating a new unit there that's going to be uh, making decisions on the claims and uh, administering, the, uh, administering it. And that's one of the changes that was made. Um, and, and, and relating to that, um, it used to be that if a, uh, a disabled or uh, individual or their uh, survivors uh, was there if their claim was ever disputed, they would have to take that decision into circuit court. The change now is that any um, appeals or, or disputes would be handled within the VRS as an administrative process. So that there, those are some of the administrative changes that are that are taking place. It, it's not a substantive change, and hopefully we'll be able to work with VRS educate them and uh, ensure that they maintain a streamlined and uh, user-friendly operation. Okay, from what I understand, you're saying we have two paths of benefits. You have the permanently disabled and those that die in the line of duty. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. The, but in both cases, whether they're permanently disabled or whether they've been killed, what, what the Line of Duty Act benefits are is it's free health insurance to the uh, spouse and family members um, uh, for an extended period of time. Exactly, so that's where I was gonna head to. So what insurance is this? Do I get Cigna, Blue Cross? What am I getting as a benefit? What do my families uh, receive? Okay, so this is an important question and this is one of the changes that is, taken, that is taking place that will affect people who are currently on Line of Duty Act as well as people who will, will join it after July 1st. And that is that in the past, the law stated that people had to be given insurance that was comparable to the insurance they had been on when they were active duty employees. Uh, as a result of that, people all over the state were receiving different uh, different insurance benefits. Um, some of them under their former uh, plans. Some of them purchased on the individual market, uh, and it varied. And that was a, a problem for the state in terms of of costs. So they they the legislature had a study commissioned in 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 uh, by the J, by JLARC, which is the uh, General Assembly's uh, research arm. And uh, JLARC found that we the state could save about um, $38 million over 10 years by requiring all Line of Duty Act beneficiaries to receive the same health insurance under a separate plan that is set up ex exclusively for the Line of Duty Act beneficiaries. So people who are, um, who are receiving health insurance now through the Line of Duty Act will actually be transitioned 
to a line of duty act plan, a special plan, which is under COVID care. It's the state health insurance plan for state employees and retirees. And the plan that was selected is the best plan that is available under COVID care. So um, what that means is that anywhere, anywhere in the state, whoever is killed in the line of duty or who's currently disabled, they and their families will receive this uh, very high quality COVID care plan. Now, uh, the repercussions of that are that in many parts of the state, this is going to be a, a vast improvement over the health insurance programs that they were on. However, in Fairfax County, you know, there may be things that people like or don't like about the new plan. And obviously, I think a lot of the concern is, what does this mean that I will have a new insurance plan uh, if they're not currently under COVID care? Right. So, um, all, you, know, all, you know, all we have achieved is that we've made sure that every, op, uh, every optional benefit that is available for any uh, state employee or retiree is in this plan. But people are going to have a lot of questions. How does this affect me? How does this affect my network that I'm in, et cetera? And so they will be both receiving information about this transition very soon. I understand they'll be getting letters uh, hopefully next week that will explain to them how the transition will take place so that on July 1st, 2017, they will be under a new insurance plan. Uh, but also they'll be able to call and get individual questions answered as to, um, you know, what do I do about this and that. And also in the law, it does say that if there's any problems or issues with the transition to new health insurance, any delays or anything like that, that the state will provide temporary insurance. And of course, this is all uh, completely cost free uh, to the to the beneficiaries. Wow. Uh, if you have any questions, we're streaming live to Facebook in the group on Local 2068. Just post the comment. You don't have to email me. Just post the comment in the uh, this live stream that we have running now, and, and I'll read them off to uh, Ginny, Virginia, as they come in. So that sounds good. That's a very good um, insurance policy. You say it's an upgrade from what they had previously. Um, it's the highest level. Probably, I think we talked before, it's very comparable to what we have in Fairfax, the Cigna High option, which has you don't have to do the big deductibles or anything like that. It's pretty much full coverage with very minimal cost. That, that's exactly right. And so, you know, there may be some little glitches that people are concerned about, but uh, oh, fundamentally, uh, it, it should be fine for everybody. And as I said, uh, statewide, it's uh, a huge improvement for your uh, brothers and sisters in the uh, fire service who are getting this in places like, you know, South Boston or Danville, who were getting, you know, pretty, pretty uh, negligible insurance before. Um, so that's one of the major changes, and that's a very big cost saving, as I said, because of the fact that they have one plan to administer instead of um, hundreds. Um, another change that's being made that's a big cost savings which is also something that you know we didn't want but um it's it's um the type of change that the um, legislature felt would uh ensure that the program is sustainable for future generations and that it wasn't going to be something that you know was going to be doubling in cost every few years and that change is that currently beneficiaries will receive these low to benefits after they reach uh, Medicare eligibility age in the form of supplemental insurance, free supplemental insurance for life for them and, and their spouse. Now, the change is that for people who join the Line of Duty Act program after July 1st, that when they reach Medicare age 65, they, their low to benefits will stop. So they will know when they enter the program that they will have to obtain some kind of supplemental insurance at age 65 on their own, uh, which is unfortunate. And if their spouse is under the age of 65, then that person will remain on the program until they obtain Medicare. But um, the other, this is the other major savings, uh, which is that the load of benefits will stop uh, at age 65 um, again, we didn't want this to happen, but it will save 
again, close to $40 million uh, over a 10-year period. And uh, it, it's it's going to make sure that, that the Line of Duty Act remains and uh, is sustainable and affordable for the state. Insolvent. So, so you're saying if you're permanently disabled, it stops when the permanently disabled person turns 65. Otherwise, it's when the spouse or uh, reaches 65 is when the benefits stop. Yeah, so if, if the person is, is permanently disabled, and again, this doesn't apply to anybody who's on the program prior to July 1st, they still get it for life. But if a, if a recipient is turned 65 and they're married to someone who's 60, that spouse doesn't come off of LODA. They stay on the program until they reach 65 as well. But again, this is for people in the future. Gotcha. This makes me look smarter when I put my reading glasses on. We have a couple of questions. That one actually was um, two or three questions. That So we just knocked that one out right now. Uh, Mark Lucas is asking, what about retired employees that, that had to retire under disability? Is it fully retroactive? And are there restrictions or expiration time? So we, I think we talked about the expiration right now with 65. But what about people that were are retired now that were forced out because of disability? Are they... So is this if, retroactive at all? No. So, so if if someone is already retired on disability and is receiving line of duty act benefits, then they will continue to receive these benefits the rest of their life. This restriction on age sixty five only applies to people who become injured or are killed after July first. Gotcha. The gotcha. only thing. The only thing that's retroactive in that sense is that they will be moved over to the COVA care plan. So they already have to be. So if they retired because of a disability and they were allowed into the program, they'll, they'll get the updates and all that. So they're already in. They can't retroactively just go back and apply. They, they had anybody, to already filed a claim. If somebody was retired on disability for a work related for a work related disability then they should have applied for and received line of duty act benefits gotcha i have another question for you uh ryan mcgill asked we have seen continued cuts to vrs does moving loda to vrs open up to funding cuts under vrs i guess that goes back to how is this being funded in the budget in virginia so, the, so the, the, there was a, a major change in the funding of the Line of Duty Act that occurred in 2010. Prior to that, it was funded by the general treasury of the state. Um, in 2010, because of the rising costs, the General Assembly decided to dump those costs onto the localities. Now, we were promised uh, that as a result of these changes and these compromises that occurred in the plan, we were promised that the state will now, uh, over the course of this coming year, develop a plan to reassume a substantial part of the costs of the Line of Duty Act benefits. So they, the reason why they moved it over to the localities is because they felt that um, they didn't want to be responsible for the rising costs Obviously, politically, what happened then is that the localities jumped in and said, you know, we need to change this. We need, you know, we need to change this. This is too expensive. And that's what sort of generated um, all this uh, activity around um, uh, reforming Line of Duty Act. And so um, it's, it's currently funded by the localities, but we understand that it will be shifted over more to the state so there will be less pressure on the localities to, to keep the funding going. Uh, so we've been assured that with these changes and with these savings, uh, that uh, a dedicated funding stream will be established. Uh, it's, it's likely that the municipalities or the localities will remain responsible to a small degree for the costs, but that largely that the state will agree to go back and take it over again. Gotcha. I have another question for you. We kind of touched on this one a little bit, but maybe we can clarify it a little bit and help alleviate some of the concerns. Mike Regan is asking, I have Kaiser Permanente and have had the same doctor, doctors, because, you know, Kaiser, everything in one building for 30 years. Do I have the option to purchase Kaiser 
or somehow coordinate with Kaiser. This is a big takeaway since Kaiser is integrated. You know, you walk into a building and everything is in one place. They don't have to run around. So can you address that concern? I think that's a question that should be uh, that he needs to contact the uh, the uh, uh, helpline that's on that uh, website. That's a specific question I don't know the answer to. It's a good question. It's a really good question. So the coordinator phone number, it's at the bottom. You see it right there. 1-804-786-1856. Connie Jones. Does that sound familiar? Connie Jones is the person who's been administering the Line of Duty Act for many years since it was established. Gotcha. So the website is V-A-L-O-D-A V-A-L-O-D-A dot org. And right at the very bottom, you'll see the contact information right there. So... That takes care of that question. <laughs> Is there anything else we have not gone over? I'll check for more questions from the audience. But we have uh, a good audience watching, by the way. Thank you for joining us, everyone. So yes, and I want to I want to talk about some of the other changes that were made. So far, we've touched on two, which is the uh, transition to a special LODA health insurance plan for everybody. Um, the second thing was that for. Uh, new recipients after July 1st, they will lose coverage when they hit age 65. There's some other changes as well. Uh, one of them is that um, in, the, in the future, if there is a surviving spouse uh, after July 1st, a person who joins the program after July 1st, in other words, somebody who was killed after July 1st of this year, their surviving spouse and children under age 26 will receive free health care through this LODA plan. However, if that uh, surviving spouse decides to remarry, at that point, they will lose the, um, uh, the LODA benefits. So future remarriages, and in the past this wasn't the case, but for future remarriages, they, they, before the, per, the spouse remarries, they should check into what is the impact going to be on their line of duty act health insurance benefits. And they're going to want to take that into account. It won't apply to people who have previously remarried before July 1st. But in the future, it will apply. Uh, another change is that if a person who joins LODA after July 1st they're, therefore, they are permanently disabled from doing their previous job. If they find work that pays more than their job, their pre-injury job, then that person's Line of Duty Act health insurance benefits are also suspended because they have because of that higher income that they're receiving. If subsequently the income were to dip below their previous salary, then they would be able to resume coverage for them and their and their families under the Line of Duty Act. That's not something that's something that we were opposed to. And uh, it happens so rarely that it didn't show that it was going to be a great deal of savings. But it is something that was adopted by the legislature. All right, we have more questions for you. Okay. Love it. Mark Lucas is asking, uh, what about retirees that live outside the Commonwealth? You did your job in Fairfax, but you actually live in Maryland or Pennsylvania or something like that. Do they have to reside in Virginia? Oh, no, not at all. They can live where they want to live and there'll be um, there'll be uh, a way to, um, you know, participate in the plan wherever they live. OK, so so if anything happens, even that family, if they decide they don't want to live in Virginia anymore, uh, they could just move to Florida or someplace that the cost of living is even lower uh, to adjust their financial purposes, right? Absolutely, and they'll still keep their free health care insurance. Good. Uh, is there, uh, Ryan McGill is asking, has the dedicated funding happened yet? Is this already signed, good to go, July 1st? I think, I, I live in Maryland, so are they still doing budget talks right now? Is no, this no, no. done? No, that wasn't part of... Uh, that hasn't been done yet. That's a, a verbal promise. So um, that's something that we will be uh, reaching out to uh, the Appropriations Committee to talk about for for, ne for next year. But um, right now, everything's the same as far as funding. 
Um, but as I say, uh, we were all promised, all the stakeholders were promised that if uh, we were um, collaborative uh, in this process of trying to find ways to uh, reduce the, um, the sort of um, growth that was occurring in the cost of the program, that, uh, that we, would, uh, we were assured that the state would take responsibility for the funding. So that's something that we will be looking for. So the state is making sure they take care of their people at the they, best possible cost, but still take care of it. It's the balancing act is what you're I saying. I can say that, yes. And I can say, too, that, um, you know, the, the firefighters, the Virginia professional firefighters, our position was we were happy with the program as it was before. We had no complaints. And so we thought it was, was fine. And obviously, uh, we were invited to the table because of concerns by the municipalities, by the state, uh, about the about the costs that were doubling based upon research by by JLARC. So I, I think that um, we have been given a lot of credit for being um, responsible partners, uh, for being uh, collaborative, and because uh, we could have said no to everything, and that doesn't mean that that nothing would have happened. Eventually, something would have happened that we were opposed to, but instead, what we said was. You know, we don't want uh, some of these other options that were on the table included, uh, for example, cutting uh, cutting people out of the program who had uh, the presumptive diseases such as uh, heart lung presumption or the cancer presumptions, you know, cutting them out of the program or cutting people out of the program who um, were not completely eligible for workers' comp or, you know, various ways of restricting access. And we didn't want to restrict access in any way. We preferred you know, to see other compromises in terms of the, the benefits themselves. Can you explain how much work the Virginia Professional Firefighters has done to make sure that our people are taken care of with this? Because it seems like VRS is always under attack. And if this is going to be under VRS, how do we make sure that this great benefit that's been worked out is going to remain? Um, that's a great question. I mean, we we are working very hard. We went to we went to practically monthly meetings on this. We're in constant contact with um, Delegate uh, Chris Jones, who's the chair of the Appropriations Committee, who led the task force here. Um, we're down there. Um, the uh, you know Robbie Bragg, the president, uh, Art Lipscomb, who's the uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, director, um, and um, all of the um, volunteers and activists, Tom Simcoe. Uh, and uh, folks from your local who go down there, uh, you know, we're trying to stay on top of this and we're fighting every day for uh, to make sure that um, we preserve the benefits that uh, you folks are, are receiving. And I think it's I think it's to your credit in terms of, you know, your leadership um, uh, at the local level and statewide that the benefits that we have secured are as good as they are. The death benefits and, and health insurance benefits under the Line of Duty Act, as well as the presumptions, are among the best in the country. And that's unusual in a state like Virginia, where in many cases uh, unions don't have that much clout. And so, um, but a we right are- A right-to-work state. Yeah, we're gonna stay on top of it, absolutely. And there's no you know, trust but verify. We will stay on top of this. We will be uh, in close contact with the VRS as they develop their program uh, with DHRM, which is the department that uh, manages the health insurance program. And you know, we really wanna hear any concerns that people have, things that are going wrong, things that don't seem right, problems that any individual has. You know, let us know and we will um, follow up uh, myself and um, the, the other um, leadership and uh, of the local and the state level to, um, to to get things fixed that don't work out. So um, that's that's what the um, you, that's what your union is for is to be there in Richmond, you know, always uh, trying to stay on top of things and, and uh, fighting for uh, the benefits that you all have have, have so rightly earned. Can, can you elaborate just on this? Because one of the common things. We have an election going on with our battalion representatives right now. And some of the questions that, that our younger members are saying or some others have been in 10, 15 years, why, do, why should I be a member of the local? What does the local do for me? There's a lot of these things like this that they have no idea exist. Can you, can you, do you have anything to tell them about all the work that they do not see in the background of something they may or may not even use, but knowing it's there? Can you can you address to them 
why yeah, they should even be a member of a local? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you, your your uh, your local union and the state organization and the national union that you all are a part of is absolutely critical uh, for, for example, the Line of Duty Act benefits is a good example. It's not just whether you yourself become disabled or are killed, but it's for your peace of mind so that you know that embarking on a dangerous profession that you are taking care of your uh, your, your spouse, your, uh, your children, and uh, that's true for Line of Duty Act benefits as well as the workers' comp benefits that, that we fight for. For example, uh, we were all down there in the legislature this year trying to expand the cancer presumption uh, for firefighters. It's well established that you know, that you are exposed to toxins at a higher incidence than uh, regular uh, citizens and that uh, there are links uh, between exposures and um, uh, cancers. And so we currently have a presumption that covers some but not all cancers. And so one of the things that your union does is we are down there fighting uh, to expand them. We are lobbying. We are working politically to try to make sure that we get people in office who understand and, and uh, respect, you know, the work that you do. Uh, so that's just one of the things that the union does is is to uh, be very active uh, at the legislature. And I can tell you that if you didn't have a union uh, at the table fighting for to protect your line of duty act benefits, it's very likely that these benefits that we have now secured for the future uh, would have been shredded. You wouldn't have these benefits at all if you didn't have a union there uh, because one individual person is not going to be able to sway the entire general assembly or legislature but together with, with one unified voice and with the uh all of the uh activists and professionals who are working on your behalf that's why you have the benefits that you do have so we need everybody to support the union to join and to be active and participate Especially to be active and participate. I mean, just like every other local, everybody has that issue because no one sees this stuff. And it, 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 it's it's frustrating. We haven't even, you're even talking about the state level. We haven't talked about the local level or even the federal level. We're just talking about the, the Virginia level that you're involved in. Well, maybe we can have another uh, uh, another Facebook discussion about all the many other things uh, that the union is working on at the local, the state, and the national level that are so important. And you're absolutely right. People need to get involved, participate, help out, uh, and that's how that's how we make an impact. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with contracts or anything like that because we don't have that. It's all the stuff to take care of us while we're here. And if something, God forbid, happens to us for our families that we know they're taken care of and we don't have to worry about it. That's exactly right. And I, and I got to say that I, I work with um, a number of different unions, and I think you all should be very, very proud and pleased with uh, with your leadership and with the work that's been done at the, uh, the firefighters. Um, you, you all do a great job. Okay, great. Well, there's no more questions in Virginia. I really do appreciate your time in doing this. And uh, now that we have Skype and everything working, we should do this a few more times. I, I think this is this has been the most beneficial information we've had in a long time. Getting it from outside of our local because people get tired of hearing it from us. And it's great having someone like you on the inside to tell everybody what's really going on down Virginia and, and just you know explain to them what what we get that we don't even know about. Uh, I've I really enjoyed it. It's been great, and thank you for having me on. And as I said, we'll continue to answer any questions that come up. Just pass them along to me, and uh, we will respond. Great. And we're going to get this video out to Virginia professional firefighters if they want to share it as well. We'll get it out to retirees and, and all that. So I really appreciate that, and I'm, I'm going to take your word that we're going to do this again. Great. Thanks, Chris. we look pretty good right now. We look like CNN. We look great. <laughs> and I look pretty smart. Great job. So. All right. Thank you, everybody. Until next time. Thanks.